he was born in Cameroon. What was what was Francis's life like in Cameroon? Uh, it was very tough, uh, very very tough. But um, I do believe that that was my that's your foundation. Regardless of what happened, I mean, if I have to go back, I. Swear to God, I will not choose that life. Although I still believe that it's still the best life that I could have had as a kid. Even though I couldn't, I can't choose that life. It was the best, best thing for me that I needed. Your your father was a street fighter. Is that kind of what drove you to the MMA? Is that what I mean? How? Because I, I mean, he was a he was a multiple staff. He wasn't only that aspect. First of all, I love combat. Okay. Like at my very always, you, know, you always. And my as far as I, as I can remember, I always love combat. You know, in uh in Cameroon, um, the men's ball would be like soccer, football. Okay. And uh, I was playing football because it's for us. It's like culture. Right. You know, like you don't have to love football to play football. Right. It's like culture stuff. Everybody. Every kid play football, but it wasn't my thing. My thing was fighting. And uh, I remember, like, <laughs> I was asking kid around, like, okay, let's try this. Let's try this. Uh, play the, the bad cop, the bad guy, and the uh, good guy, right. and this. And then I'm like, you're too violent. You're too. <laughs> <laughs> were you were you always the bigger kid? For my age, yeah. yeah. But uh, I grew up around uh, people that were like three years older than me. Right. You know, we were going to school, like, I was three three years younger, but mm -hmm. we were all the same size until, like, maybe the day that uh, at school they have to read our birthday, mm -hmm. and people would look around, like, damn, he's, there's a baby in the class. Yeah. <laughs> what the hell are you doing here, <laughs> right? Like, because I was younger, but I was just as big as any, everyone, right. but they didn't know. Right. How many brothers and sisters do you have? I have three brothers and one sister. I'm the second oldest. And then second older, and then my sister it is the fourth mm -hmm. out of five. So, obviously in Cameroon, I'm assuming that you come from a, a working class family, that you guys had to work. You worked, if I'm not mistaken, in salt as a child. No, it's San, uh, San Mines. San, San Mines, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I think we were even a little below the walking. Class. Okay, you were below that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't quite know what below working class is, but okay, we'll go with that. Yeah, we were below working class <laughs> because uh, unlike us, me, my brother and I, uh, no other kids started to work at that age. Right. Right, like nine-year-old working in the sun quarry, what the hell can you do? I mean, like even the shovel, uh, empty shovel uh, for a nine years uh, old kid was already enough, mm -hmm. right? L lucky for me, I was bigger than nine years right. old, so I could have carried that and I, I was strong, right? So I could have carried that and shovel a little bit of sand and after go do different stuff, you know, uh, we, were, we had to do that in order to sustain uh, our life. To, mm -hmm. to help in the house. So, yeah, I did that my entire life. So uh, later on in my, uh, later on, uh, when I w we were a teenager, other kids were coming, maybe around 14, 13, mm -hmm. other kids was, were now coming to do that because they feel like, okay, this is the age that they can start. But by the time we but were you, pro. But they started at 13, 14, you already been doing that oh, since we you were, were nine. Pro. So we were like the teacher, like, teaching them right. how to start, how to work, right. you know, working them through everything. What I tell people is that my upbringing was kind of hard too, but working the job that I had, Francis, it let me know what I didn't want to do for the rest of my life. Doing that in the sand mines, did that let you know, man, I ain't trying to do this when I get my dad's age or when I get older? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it wasn't only that. Everything that I have done in my life, I remember so many times, uh, I haven't worked but this was like later on, mm -hmm. uh, I would work in the sand mine uh, because I was always concerned about my life, like future, think about my future, like, okay, what will happen at this moment? And I would work in the sand mine. I see this guy like maybe 55, 60 years old, he's shivering sand. I would look at him and then like have like, you know, feel weird like this. 
you know, like um, I have a goosebump, like shit. So if I don't do something, I'm going to find myself here at 60 years or something. That's not going to happen. Right. There's no way that that's going to happen. Right. He has to change. He right. has to be different. And that's happened to me a lot. Even when I left the village, I went to the city. We were uh, carrying uh, merchandise, uh, unloading truck and mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and there was still a people older that was working that job. And now I'm like, man. So if I stay here, um, if I get settled, I might just end up like this guy because this guy actually uh, just think like, oh, okay, let's just do it. And then didn't think of tomorrow. And then year just go by, but, he didn't realize. Right. Then I'm like, no, I have to be a, 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 a awake. I have right. to be awake. Notice right. the time going and because this can end like this. I can find myself here right. at this age. But the problem is that like when you have those kind of talk, thought, if you express it, then it's kind of like insulting those people. And then in Africa, like when you, when a adult feel, a elder person feel a, uh, insult by you, is very disrespectful, mm. right? So I am in the village, uh, maybe I'm 10 years old, 12, 15 years old, and uh, they all believe that I'm going to become a farmer or a carpenter or maybe go learn mechanic and stuff. I'm like, no, I'm going to do this. I'm going to uh, do uh, be a professional fighter. They'll be like, like who? Nobody has ever done that here. Like, it's not mean for us, right? It's not for us. It's for right. somebody. Right. Look, look around you and this is your reality. Right. And I'm like, yeah, I agree. But although I still want to give it a shot, so therefore, it seems like, okay, you are looking down to people like you didn't have a better life. You didn't choose a better job. And then they started to feel that and reject on you. They didn't just because nobody has a big in, a dream big enough to understand that you are just dreaming. Right. You know, you are not even thinking about them, but you're thinking about right. you and what you want. You're not to do. looking down on them, but no, you're, you're looking better looking for yourself. Down on them, but you are looking up for, for, for yourself. Yeah. Right? So... That's how like my upbringing was also tough because like just carry, just keep dreaming, just have this mentality of a dreamer. He was something hard to manage out there in the in middle of a people that they don't have dream, they don't expect something right. big to happen for them. And that set me to the point that people were like, oh, this kid is a bad kid. I was a very bad kid for people. Like when I go someplace, people didn't even want me to mix in the middle of their kid. I'm like, this kid is a bad kid. He's going to intoxicate our kid right here. <laughs> like his mindset is not good. <laughs> he's dreaming so high. Like he's going to end up robbing a bank, a bank, because he want an easy life. Right. Like, what do you mean an easy life? I'm saying I'm going to, I might just go out there and get punches on my face. It's right. not easy life. Right. Like, but they didn't believe that it could have happened. Basically, in the country that they really have no example, no example of mm -hmm. a person that have done it, have succeeded in it. Even people that has more opportunity and started earlier, um, when this, you see, um, um, uh, documentary on their life or a, uh, watch them on the news, they go back and, you know, want to tell their story. This guy is in the house with uh, dust everywhere. He couldn't even have a uh, cement floor mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And it was tough. Right. So like, to be honest, to this day, I don't blame peop those people not to believe me because the reality around was tough enough to, to believe in something like that. But I was so driven by my dream. The power of my dream was so big and I could, I could feel that only on my own. I could share to, with people what I'm feeling and I was so confident about it. And people was looking at me like, this kid is losing his mind. Like, he's out of the real world, right. like come down on earth, bro. Right. You know, like, yeah, so it was that. I read you were a, a, a loner as a kid. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't really a loner by choice, by uh, de decision. It just happened like that, you know, like- People don't want you playing with their kids because you a bad influence. <laughs> you no, dream too big. No, like um, when my parents get divorced, mm -hmm. I was six years old. Okay. Um, so. Uh, we started to live in, in different family. Right. Uh, like we're going to go to this family member that will help take us for like maybe six months. Mm -hmm. And 
within these six months, uh, maybe we will go to school and you will start a new school and you don't have a friend. Not only you don't have a friend, you're a new guy. You need time to have friends. Mm. But um, one thing that wasn't playing on our avant on my advantage was the fact that uh, to get to the um, even at at the school, you know, when you come at uh, in a new school mm. and then you're the cool guy, it's it's easy to have friends. Right. Everybody want to be your friend, mm -hmm. but you are the kids that come with your shoes that is I don't know like. No right, mm -hmm. and then they're gonna kick you out uh, of school, of the classroom someday because you didn't just have a pen to take note, or you didn't have a notebook or stuff like that, or you didn't pay your uh, scholar fee. So, so you had to pay to go to school? Oh yeah, we paid to go to school. Oh, yeah. Oh, we paid to go to school. For regular public school, you had to pay? Yeah. It's cheaper, but we pay. <laughs> <laughs> we have to pay, and uh, so you are a new you are a new kid, and then you are the one that is always being embarrassed. So everyone want to step back. Nobody is very interested to be your friend. You want to be friend. You want to fit in. You know, you are just a kid. You know, you want to belong, right. but you don't belong. It's hard to find. Uh, you don't. You, you never bring food at school to share with somebody. So nobody want to share with you because usually when kids share with you, it's in the expectation that tomorrow maybe you share with them as right. well, but you never bring anything. Right. Nobody want to share with you. Nobody want to even hang out around. So then he was like that continuously. And then, uh, and then I kept trying. But one thing that I was doing, I created a virtual war in my mind, you know, because the life was so tough. Uh, a lot of things was missing in my life that the only way that I could get those things right as I wanted was in my mind. And I, and I created it. And I was living a life in my mind. I was living two lives, actually. Right. Like one on earth for real and one just in my head. And it was a real life that I have a family and everything and we go to school, everything is good. We come back home, there's food, we eat and go uh, do our homework, everything. Like just perfect as I want with my parents, uh, always at home, my siblings, which by the time I, I didn't even know where the, my, uh, my other sibling were. One was here, the other one was there, two was there. <laughs> we were all spread yeah. around. So the only way to uh, reunite us was in my, in my in mind. mind. <laughs> did, and you say your parents got divorced when you were six. Did you understand? Did your parents sit you down and say, you know? No, no, it? no. They, we, they don't do that. We don't have that uh, aspect in Africa. They don't have that uh, meant emotion aspect in Africa. You have to understand, like, I'm talking of a, uh, like, Growing up, for example, as a kid, mm -hmm. maybe never get hugged. Even when you're home with your dad, you never get hugged by, with your dad. So this is the level of emotion. Well, the emotional have, attachment is the not. The emotional attachment is not that. We don't take that emotional comp uh, component. Like I was, after one year uh, with my parents being divorced, I was uh, with my aunts. And then uh, I saw because when they divorced, I stayed with this aunt like two years and a half, almost three years uh, before I started to go this place six months, one year. But that was the longest that I, I stayed somewhere else uh, from maybe six to, I don't know, six to 15 or 16. So I was there like, um, was just seven years old. And one day I asked my aunt, which is the uh, bigger sister of my mom. I asked her like, why my dad and my mom couldn't live like your husband and you? That wasn't a good question to ask mm. because she didn't understand how a seven years old kid can understand something like that, can think like that. So for them, I was just a spirit living in the kid body. So they always, Believe. She always believed, she passed away like five years ago, but even though she believed that I wasn't just me, like a spirit was living in me, she didn't understand that I was just missing my family right. so much that he was 
I was able to notice stuff like right. that because all the time I'm looking at this, I'm like, why, where's my parent, my own parent? Right. I'm seeing them with their kid. I'm like, where's my own parent? Why my own parent? You wanted what they had. I wanted what they had. So from the moment that I'm missing those stuff, I notice it. Right. You said you, you, you worked in the sand mines for over 20, uh, over 10 years. So until you were 22 and you saw people die in those sand mines. And you said, as you mentioned earlier, you saw someone you believed to be 55, 60 years of age and you were just a child. And you said, I don't want that to be me. That's not going to be me. I see better. And you mentioned that you had two, you lived two lives. You had the life that you had in Cameroon and you had the life that you had in your mind. Yeah that you envisioned that there was something better for Francis Ngannou away from Cameroon? Uh, at that moment, I wasn't thinking a way of Cameroon. I was just thinking of the future. I don't know where that future would, would, would have been. Until, I think, until really, like when I started boxing at 22, I realized that even with boxing, I'm not going anywhere in Cameroon. I'm not going to do anything. Even if I'm the best, Right. it's not going to be uh, helpful. So that's when you, so at 22 is when you first got into the the, the combat, the, the boxing game. Yeah. And you're like, obviously you're beating up all the people in Cameroon. <laughs> He's like, okay. Uh, what was I the next step? What was your thought process? Okay, I'm winning in Cameroon, but I'm never going to be what I believe I can be just being in Cameroon. Well, I, even in Cameroon, I didn't do boxing so much because after one year, I got sick. Hepatitis B, uh, and it wasn't great. So, and I was boxing and was working at the same time mm -hmm. because I was already on my own. So now I have to take care of myself, um, do this uh, regime for like six months and stuff. So I stopped boxing. And that was the moment that another like glass of cold water was thrown on, in, on my face. Like, look at the reality. And the reality was that this ain't, I ain't going anywhere with this out here. I better get out of this country wow. and go somewhere with more opportunity. Your story, here's where the story gets really, I mean, you had a, the childhood is that when you in the third world country and you're living in the, you said, we're lower than working class. But here's where it gets very interesting. And people follow me with this. At 26, you left Cameroon. You go to Nigeria. Niger, Algeria, Morocco, the Sahara Desert, the Mediterranean Sea, and Spain, just to make it to Paris, France. Now, I'm not Magellan. I'm not this great, you know, navigator or anything, but it seemed like you were just traveling in circles before you got to your ultimate destination. So, N Nigeria, Niger, Algeria, Morocco, Sahara Desert, Mediterranean. It took you over a year. Yeah, it took me 14. It took me 14 months to get all the way to, to France because all this was... Uh, um, illegal immigration, right? right? Um, a lot of people that are looking for a better opportunity mm -hmm. uh, for job, for stuff like that. Um, that lived. I mean, I left on my own, but on on the way, we met. You met with people coming from different places, right. and by the time you get in Morocco, there is like all the nationality of South uh, of us. Um, Sahara, mm -hmm. uh, South, uh, uh, Sub-Saharan, Sub -Sub, Afri yeah. African, that are up there. They have different community mm -hmm. and all with the same goal to get in, in Europe. I mean, watching that is scary. You know, I'm like, okay, so all these people are looking to go. They've been, it's been like this amount every time. Where am I going exactly? You know. You're free. But you were undeterred because you meant you were on the raft sometimes and you got turned back, you got and you just like, I'm not, I'm not going back. That's the journey of a lot of people out there. In fact, uh, I was out there just for one, one year. Uh, I can say, yes, I was very determined. I was uh, going again and again and again. I didn't settle because some people at some point they get tired, they get exhausted, they get burned out and they just uh, go back in the city and sit and just start to find a job as a builder or help somebody like work, you know, mm -hmm. and they are all in, they are not in a good situation. So they can even afford a good job. So, um, yeah, I was just doing the same. It was the same process as a lot of people. Some people 
had a better chance, have better chance, they would do it, make it from the first attempt. Some people, second attempt, some people will try two, three times and don't make it and just uh, give up, you know, or quit. How many times did it take you before you became successful and got crossed over? So in the, in the ocean, he was, I fell six times and he was the seventh time. I went to the gate uh, like three times. It didn't work. Uh, the first time I get really, really caught you got, by the barbed wire. Okay. Really bad. You got stuck, you got? Uh, yeah, I still, get some, I still get some deep scar on me. <laughs> that reminds me. <laughs> but uh, I always like prefer water because I was more comfortable in water mm -hmm. uh, and stuff. But I finally succeeded the seventh time. And it was like one year exactly from the day that I left Cameroon. Basically like one year anniversary wow. from when I left Cameroon. So I remember when we get rescued, we get rescued by the Red Cross in the, o in the ocean. Uh, he was out around like maybe eight to nine a.m. in the morning on April 3rd, 20, um, 2013. And, uh, That's my daughter's birthday. Really? 2013? April. No, April 3rd. April 3rd, yeah. And uh, I was there and these people, the other people, because it was nine of us in this raft, this little uh, swimming mm -hmm. pool raft. And then uh, they were celebrating and I was just there thinking, then I re just hit me. Oh, so some people was calling their family, but I've been there so long that I have nothing, even not a phone, no money, nothing. <laughs> Uh, I, the, even the reason why I was in that raft was because I have so much experience by failing that I was a captain. I don't know how to swim. I don't know how to Hold swim. Hold on. But, you but I know how to paddle. You said you like water more yeah. so than, uh, but you can't swim. No. I can't swim. <laughs> Hold on. You in the Mediterranean Sea and you can't swim a lick? No. Oh my goodness. So you, you think you think if you can swim, you you can swim from the Mediterranean? No, but I mean I mean okay, you can, so that that No, matter. I ain't saying swim, but you can swim. <laughs> I mean I ain't gonna go straight down like a rock. I mean I can stay up, I can stay afloat for a while. And then what would be the the end of it? You can get back to the raft. If you fall out to the raft, if you press No, no, then I will get back How? If, if there's a possibility to get off to the raft, we have life jacket at least. Oh, so y'all had where'd y'all get the life jacket from? Oh, no, no. The first rule is to have life jackets. Okay. You are going to the, in the ocean. Yes. Hey, <laughs> with this raft. He needs, he needs uh, a little nail like this to, to blow that shit like, <laughs> and it's over. <laughs> doesn't matter if you know how to swim. If you're in the middle of the ocean, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. So the minimum, the bare minimum is life. the life jacket. And sometimes we don't have a life jacket. Um, do, uh, you know this thing that, I don't know how they call it, we call it in French Vessi, that they put inside the tire. Yeah, in the tube. Huh? In the tube. In the tube. Then we take it, we blow it, and then we cut the other one, we tie it, we put on our waist like this, we, we get it wrap mm -hmm. on our wow. stuff like this. That one is even better than <laughs> better life than life jacket. And cheaper. <laughs> you said you didn't tell anybody that you were leaving. Why? Because when you if I say I'm leaving, what would be your first question? Where you going? Why? Exactly. <laughs> Where you going? <laughs> and if I say I don't know, what would you think of me? Uh well, since you don't know where you're going, well, you might as well stay here. I'm gonna try to talk you out of it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you might just, oh, you might just think that I'm, you, I'm crazy. Yeah. Basically that since I've been having this crazy dream that nobody <laughs> understand, then now I wake up someday and say, oh, I'm going. Why are you going? I don't know. Come on, man. What the hell is that, right? right? And also, he was so stressful. You did, I, I mean, you don't know, you're walking into the unknown territory. Yeah. You don't know if you will ever come back or not. Right. You don't know how it's out there. You don't know if you will make it, if you will survive. You don't know if you come back uh, alive or if you, even your body will ever come back or if you come back, you will come back in five years or in 10 years. You don't know. I mean, like, how are you gonna tell that to people? It's you didn't think your family would be worried? that you just took off and they didn't say like, where's Francis? Francis didn't come, where's Francis? Francis didn't Yeah, where? but if they're worried, 
when I'm gone, that means I'm gone already. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> I'm gone already. So that's another thing. So what so when you get ready to so what do you guys do for food? Okay, you're going, you're gonna you're gonna be in this rap and you're gonna be in it for an extended period of time. How much food did you get? No, in the raft you don't have food. I mean, um and it's not What like, y'all eating? No, it's not like you, you don't spend days on the raft, right? Uh it's hours. Couple hours. Hey. In that situation, you can do 24, make 24 hours without eating. You ain't, you ain't get nothing. You ain't get no fruit. You ain't grab no bananas. You ain't grab nothing. No, uh, you don't. I mean, <laughs> it's a very, you're hiding from the police and sometimes you can get stuck somewhere for five hours, just stay in one spot because there is a police car there, because there is a police somewhere around or somebody right. that can potentially alert the police or right. something. And then you will just hide like that all night long. We are doing this all night long. We start our journey as soon as uh, the night fall and then uh, waiting in the morning, like maybe five, five to six, it depends. The moment that they call prayer, because uh, there is this uh, prayer uh, every morning that mm -hmm. they call and is a sign. We are expecting the, the uh, people that uh, are watching uh, overnight watching uh, to go pray at that moment. So it's the opportunity for us to put the raft in the water. Mm -hmm. All night long, we will be watching uh, watching the wave because your raft is your raft is this big. And then sometimes the wave is coming all the way high here and you look at your, the wave, you look at your raft, you're like, <laughs> there's no you way. And sometimes you try, you force, you force to go to the, uh, to those waves and then he will take you and smash you back. And you better be on somewhere that they sand, no rock. Because if you go in the be in between of rocks to put the raft, even if you find a spot to put the raft, sometimes when wave are very big, they will grab you and slam you on those rocks. Right. <laughs> so, <clears throat> What about like water? Did you take water? No. So basically, so for 24 hours, I mean, maybe 24, maybe 48 hours? I mean, sometimes hours. some people, yes, yeah, sometimes you can have something uh, in your pocket, you get prepared, mm -hmm. but you are not going to carry food. If you have something like a cereal bar or a bread, you know, is a, uh, is a cup, so it's burned very low. Mm -hmm. If you have it, good. But you also have to know that sometimes people go to those places uh, without even having uh, what to eat. They don't have nothing left, you know, but their only drive is to get, get to a better life. Right. So what was it? I mean, because not only you like you had to go through the forest, sometimes you had to go by land. I know you said you chose you like water better than land. So the conditions, <clears throat> and you mentioned like it was so many different sub-Saharan that was making this trek. You, you know, how, on estimate, how many people you think it were on a given time making that trek? A thousand, thousand. ten thousand, five thousand, twenty thousand? No, not that much, but a couple of thousand. Couple of thousand? At least, yeah. The condition, uh, when you're trying the gate, because when, you, uh, when you're trying the gate, you guys are gonna live in the forest. Right. <laughs> and then uh, even like in the winter, in the winter, uh, the water condition is very bad, right. very aggressive, yeah. it's very cold. Mm -hmm. the, the water is not stable at all, right. so you can't even try. Right. You know, it's like... A so there is a time, like, okay, we're going to go, say, like, the spring or the summer. Yeah. The yeah, water's yeah. calmer, the yeah, water's yeah, warmer, yeah, 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 yeah. and you have, you know, the weather is nicer. Yeah. You don't want to be on the water when it's cold. Yeah. That, uh, there's a moment, moment that they call it out. Nobody is going on the water because it's a... It's too dangerous. Yeah, too, too dangerous. So on all those voyages, so what did you do to stay in shape? Because like you're a fighter, you said you always wanted to be a fighter. That was going to be your thing. So did you, like if you were in the forest, did you do push-ups? Did you do sit-ups? I mean, what did you... I did push-up than I can do now. Like uh, I was doing, I get to the point that I was doing like, uh, 300 push-up a day, like five sections of 60 push-up, yeah. like 
normal. And right. then with some apps, some stuff like that. But just because we have nothing to do. And then we get into Spain after that, afterward. Right. Mm -hmm. They put us in jail for two months. Nothing, you, you can't do anything there. Just maybe push up, work some bench. Right. Whatever you can do. So you spent two years in, in Paris? So how, how long were you in? Almost four years in almost Paris. Almost in jail? No, no, two months. Two months. Two months. In w Spain. In the Spain. was in Spain. Then you got to Paris. Yeah. Then I left. When they free us, uh, we went to this, uh, those association. Uh, after a couple, couple of weeks, we left. And uh, actually, I was going to Germany. I wasn't going Yeah, yeah, to you Paris. wanted to go to Germany. What, why would you want to go to Germany? What's in Germany? There was a Klitschko brother and the heavyweight boxing at that time was moving up there. Okay. In France, uh, there wasn't really like a boxing stuff that right. was driving me there. And I was chasing boxing because at first, if I would have to choose, I would have come straight to America. Right. There's not a path like that to come to America. Right. Then I want to go to the UK. But problem now, the UK is not in the Schengen zone. So even when we get there, with no, uh, you try and get into Europe. And when they free you, you need to do another similar stuff and go north in France and try and wait for months and I don't know, maybe more to try to go to the UK. I was like, oh man, I'm tired. I'm going to Germany. Right. Uh, I mean, I don't speak any German, but uh, sport doesn't need language. I will learn over time, but by the time I will be uh, boxing. How did you meet people? How did you make friends? Because, you know, you say you weren't a loner by choice. Is that you know, when your parents separated and, and, you know, you had to go with this aunt and you went with this relative to, to and so when you go to different schools, kids were a little apprehensive. Um, so how did you meet people? How did you make friends? Well, <laughs> I wasn't going to make friends. I mean, I think uh, over, uh, I get to the point, when I was a kid, I get to the point that I understand my reality. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I stopped trying to make friends. I just... And I, and I think that was even the best thing that happened to me, you know, like I just accept my situation and just take it as it was and just be my own friend. Mm -hmm. And he, he worked out perfectly. Uh, I've never been dependent on anybody. I just... You don't have a whole lot of friends now, do you? No, no, I don't. Even <laughs> now, because the problem is that when I get later on in life, I get in a good position, uh, a better situation, but I was so used to be alone. Uh, and then that's the moment that people, uh, some people, people would think, I mean, you're a good profile to right. be friend. You know, you're a cool guy now, but you're so used to be alone. Right. That you, that contact with people live, being around all the time, right. you can do it. You know, like if I go somewhere, if I go into a party or somewhere that there's so many people, like at some point, I need to step out to go somewhere that I'm alone. Otherwise, because it drains my energy. You're an it introvert. Me, it, yeah, it gets me exhausted. So I need to go out somewhere that I'm by myself, then I refill my energy. Right. But if I can deal with like constant uh, uh, company, you find a boxing gym, how did you know that the people there were legit? How did you know, like, okay, this, this, this is it, this is it? I didn't know that he was legit. I just, have to, I just had to try, and I know that I had to start somewhere. Right. It wasn't about being legit. Boxing, at the end of the day, boxing gym will not make you a boxer. The only thing, you can find the best boxing gym, but you are not just a boxer and you will never become a boxer, right? right. Um, it's up to you. And if you are really a boxer, maybe you start in some gym which is not that great or that doesn't have that level. Later on, you will understand and you will f find yourself in a good, good position. So like, um, I, I get in Paris, he was June 9th and then uh, it was a Sunday. And the next day, it was Monday, I just started to walk around and ask for a gym until I found this gym. Um, and it was around 4, 4 p.m. And um, they were training and I asked to see the coach. The coach wasn't there. There was a guy that was uh, um, giving a class that day named Didier Carmel. So I asked if I can meet him. 
They say yes, wait at, until the, the, the end of the class. So after the end of the class, I met him and I explained the situation. I said, I just came from Africa, I'm sleep. I don't even have where to sleep, but it's okay. I'm not asking for, I just want a place to train because I'm, I want to be, I'm going to be a world champion, you know. It's a little, um, it's a little cocky when you meet people at the gym and none of them is even like French champion and you just throw it at their face like you're going to be a world champion. Right. You know, like you think we are hanging out here <laughs> just for fun. <laughs> but that's how he came out. But he was a really good guy and then he, 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 helped, he helped me a lot. How, how long did you stay in Germany? I didn't go to Germany. That was in France. France. Yeah. You didn't, so you didn't go to Germany. So I was just, I just stopped in France, France. with, uh, because the, I was, I met with group of people there right. that were go, all going to right. France. So I'm like, okay, let's stop in France and see. Right. Then I stopped in France, but next day I was just going. I didn't just stop to like, okay, let's enjoy right. France. Right. I was just going. Right. Then I find something that I keep. And you kept finding something. <laughs> yeah. Keep digging, keep digging. So basically you left France and came to the U.S. Yeah. What was it like getting on that plane coming to the U.S.? Oh, because getting in France, yes, it was good. It was another, uh, but that was just the end, the beginning of another chapter. Right. Then you have to figure out your way in France. You are in France, uh, you have no situation, no regulation um, situation in France. Big black guy with your African accent. Good luck with that. <laughs> <Oof>. <laughs> But the women, the women probably liked you. Big black guy in France with an accent. Uh, See, not letting you have you. So this is the thing. They so um, usually. I mean, when they know you're in that situation, mm -hmm. everybody know that you in. You need one thing, paper. Mm -hmm. How to get your situation regulated. Mm -hmm. And marriage is marriage is one of those situations. Mm -hmm. So, a, a lot of women or um, they were trying to marry you. Not, they try to no, marry they you. They don't want none of that oh, because oh, for them you, they just see it's like it's like a rich. They man. think you're gonna it's use like them. It's like a rich man thinking a woman is mm -hmm. just coming okay. after okay. their money. Okay, I see. So for them, you are just coming after the. So they don't even want to think about it. It's not even a, it's not even thinkable. Right. Right. Obviously, there are some few. Uh, exception, but uh, overall, it's not even thinkable. Right. Because even when you talk to a man, and a man that that man understand that you don't have a paper, bro, he treats you like you are a uh, inferior creature, right. like you you are below him just because of the paper. And I kind of like, man, it's not like something that you earn. You didn't do anything right. to <laughs> deserve that. Right. You know, I mean. Yes, maybe you get some job, you work hard, you, you get, you build a house right. and somebody doesn't have a house. You just happen yes. to be born in France. You just have to be born in <laughs> France and that's all. You didn't do anything. Right. So don't look at, but it's a, it's the most people who act like this. So you walk around and trying to sneak and you don't even tell people. Right. Right. But you have this battle because without it, you don't, you're not in any system. Right. So when you get, came to the U.S., where was the first? Where did you like? Where did you go to when you came to the U.S.? Where did you go first? Orlando. I was going to Orlando. It was my first UFC fight. Okay. So that's when I was coming into U.S. And then, uh, as my dream was always to come to to the U.S., I remember um, I landed, and then there was this guy uh, at the baggage claim with the tablet with my name on it, UFC on top, like Francis Ngannou, and then I. We, I, I saw my name, we walked mm -hmm. through him, take my bag, and then go to the car, drive. And at that moment, I'm just thinking of that my first time in the U.S. And I'm comparing it in my first time in France. I'm like, this is so different. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking like, okay. And he was what? Not even four years ago. Yeah, four years ago. Four years ago, huh? No, two two years, two years, a uh, couple months. Yeah. Because this was December 2015. Right. I get in friend in June 2013. Right. So this was two years and maybe five or six, five months. Yeah, two years and a half. Right. 
after. And then I'm looking at me getting in France in the subway that I jumped. I didn't even pay a ticket. Right. I jumped on the subway and snake and was watching police. This that's how I'm getting in France. Right. And then ended up in the in the parking lot that I found the uh, uh, boxes and put on the floor, sleep on it like. Uh, and then I'm here landing in the U.S. and there's somebody out there. I mean that. I'm t I'm coming from uh, f uh, from a plane, right? And somebody is waiting for me. I walk there and then get in the um, uh, get in the car, drove me into the hotel, and I was I'm just laying back and watching for everything. Like, okay, just it's just going to my mind. I'm just processing stuff, right? And then we get to this hotel, Hyatt Hotel, Hyatt Residency. Mm -hmm. uh, Massive hotel. I never saw a hotel like that. And I just lay back to go there, check in, and brought my key, give me my key, room number. We went up, put my key, get in my room. I locked the door. I make sure the door is very <laughs> locked. I look my phone. I call in Cameroon, and I say, hey, I have made it. <laughs> I have made it. Because... My whole dream was to be in America. Right. That was like my biggest dream since I was a kid. Like, right. I remember like even when, since I was eight or seven, I've been making, having nickname, calling myself American boy and all this <laughs> stuff. Like, uh, and they would call me like San Francisco. Uh, and I would force people to tell people like, my name is San Francisco. Like, <laughs> to this day, my signature is SF. And people, sometimes people is like, uh, there's no S on your name. I'm like, it's my signature. You don't know my name. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm in the U.S. and I get in the U.S. in the best way. No, as I get in Europe. So like I made it, right? Right. I'm here. And I remember also 2000, 2008, we were in Cameroon when Obama won the election. Mm -hmm. The Yeah. And then... He was, the result was, came out like he was maybe 5 a.m. in Cameroon. Nobody didn't sleep. We were waiting. The first black. It was something very important. The first black president. Everybody feel related into that. Like, And then he won. And then I was there. We were celebrating, but in my mind, something was racing. Something else was racing. And I tell uh, my uncle, I'm like, okay, uh, a presidency uh, mandate is like four years in the U.S. So and renew one time, so eight years. At the end of this, I'm gonna be in the U.S. I'm gonna be, and so that I made it in 2017, 2015, and he was still a president. Um, I made it. I don't know what the <laughs> hell you're talking about. <laughs> you made it. So you I, made it. Hey, I made it. <laughs> it. So let me ask you a question. So when you got you you got to the U.S., you have the fight in Orlando. You get a check. What'd you do with the money? You go buy anything special? No. My dream is so big that obviously it's the money that I never had. But I'm looking for something else. I'm. I'm dreaming big. <laughs> I don't have time for that. Okay, that's cool. Then what next? Right. What, what am I having? Right? Right. Uh, it was all about like how the, the June, the process. Yeah. I didn't buy anything. I, I was supposed to, I wanted to go in Cameroon for vacation and they, that would be, that would have been my first time since I left. Then, uh, but at the same time, I want to fight right back, and then they gave me a fight. Um, yeah, no, I wanted to go, but you know, I was sitting there hoping to fight maybe in February, so I didn't go to Cameroon. Uh, I'm like, let's wait. Then uh, they gave me if after maybe I think it was January or early, yeah, sometime in January or uh, early February, they gave me this fight, uh, my second fight. Uh, I'm, I was going to fight Curtis Blade in uh, Zagreb, Croatia. So after that, I went back in Cameroon, and he was four years since I left. Well, listening at you, you always, even the situation with the UFC, you thought about other fighters. 
PL League, you think about other fighters. You go back home and it's thinking about your family, your community. How do I put them in a better situation? Where did you develop that from? Uh, we grew up in a very tough situation. Um, my family and I, we, our life get us very close. Mm -hmm. We are very bound, like very, very close. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, um, I used to get sick, sick in a way that I couldn't like go to the bathroom, go, to, go out there pee on my own. Mm -hmm. I need support, you know, and uh, even like, when we are working in the sun, uh, in the sun mine, like when I'm sick, they will use our money, even my brother's money, to take me to the hospital. So he wasn't like my money, your money. He was our, right. ours, you know, stuff like that. And then when you get to the point that you understand that you need, you need this, you need them, mm -hmm. and they are for some reason they are always there. Uh, then you lay there, and then you feel powerless, and then. It's hard, but you see them around, you know, gather to like do everything to support, to help you in that position mm -hmm. that you are the most vulnerable. Those help like relationship. I think one that, that was, that's like one of the uh, second thing uh, that I feel very, maybe the first thing that I feel very grateful about because regardless, I saw a lot of uh, family uh, around mm -hmm. that they were actually doing good, that growing up, maybe we will expect them to give uh, them their clothes that they don't wear anymore or the shoes that they don't want anymore. But I saw how it ended, how their family end up. I'm um, like, in fact, I think our family is by far, was by far the best, right? Because we get into the position that we just stick to each other. I mean, like, it's comforting to think that if your brother make it, is gonna think about you. Right. And then you're counting on him. You're counting on each other. So the day that you make it, you also have this, this in you. Uh, and we, we were so family focused, you know, like, um, and I always miss this, my family reunion, mm -hmm. that uh, my first goal was to make this happen, you know, until like I started to make the family, re those family reunion, my, our dad wasn't at the table, but I was able to gather everyone and put in one table, maybe for Christmas, for something, or maybe just for the party that I came back home and decided that we're gonna throw right. this party. And uh, uh, the good thing about it is like, when you feel like you have that power, right. okay, uh, somebody doesn't, is not missing because he, he's out there working. How much you making it work? I get you, bro, come. When I say come, everybody come. Right. <laughs> you open the gym and can <clears throat> How difficult was it? Has it? Is it difficult for you to say no? Because it's, you strike me as a very generous person. No, especially I say no a lot. <laughs> In fact, even, no, no, listen. You have to understand, I'm coming from a country, uh, country that a lot of people are in the very uh, bad condition. Bad condition. Mm -hmm. If you take their problem, it's gonna drown you. You can you can handle. So you can't save everyone. You, huh? you can't save. You, f you have to save yourself first, mm -hmm. and to get out of the water before trying to take somebody out of the water. Otherwise, both of you you will drown. So even when I wanna help somebody, sometime mm -hmm. he will come and explain his problem. I'm like, bro, figure it out. That's your shit. <laughs> I will go think of a problem. Think of like what could be the solution. Mm -hmm. But I don't want a grown man to just sit out there, lay back and wait on me. And wait for you to Because take. I'm out here working my ass off too. I'm right. not out here sitting and things are just coming to me. Mm -hmm. So I'll let you know you count on yourself. Because when you count on yourself, you never get disappointed. Right. If somebody helps you, that, that would be a great surprise. But when you count on people, you always have a bad surprise. Right. It's, you're, you yeah, rather you have a chance for disappointment. A great surprise than a bad surprise. How is it going back home now? <laughs> Both. <laughs> it's good and bad. You probably have to have a police escort when you go back. Oh no, just go out. Just stay home like a prisoner, like you. Really? Like you're running away from somebody, <laughs> knowing that you you owe nobody nothing, or you're not running away from anything, but you still have to stay home.
because that's the easiest way. Wow. You, you want to go place, you just think about like, oh, people are there, people going to meet me, going to see me. And I'm like, I'd rather just stay here, man. Leave me alone. But, <laughs> but it's great overall. That's mean you're doing good. At what age did you learn English? Um, when I started to come, when I started to come in the U.S. Um, so prior to coming to the U.S., you didn't speak English? No, even in Cameroon, we were speaking a little bit of Pidgin, mm -hmm. but no, no too much. Uh, I wasn't even speaking too much, but I always love English. And I understand that uh, at that time, I understood that I needed English. For me, uh, learning English was an investment mm -hmm. that I was going to make. Right. And that was like one of the biggest decisions when I moved in the U.S. Because when I moved in the U.S., this was early 2017. Bro, it was so hard. Like, even the word that I know, maybe because I learned at school, like water, people will say water. But we, we say water, water, what? or something like yeah. that. <laughs> and, it's, and when I say water, nobody understands anything. And when they say water, I'm like, what the hell is talking about? <laughs> and the accent and the speed that they are talking, sometimes people are talking, I think like, this guy is singing or he's talking. Like, <laughs> what's the difference? Right. I had to figure it out. So the easiest thing was just to go back, maybe in France or somewhere. But I'm um, like, remember why I came here. I need this English. I need this English for for the future, right. this is a good asset. You speak French? Yeah. Spanish? No. No Spanish? No. Even though? I was in Spanish for like, what, two months and a half? Yeah. And two, in two months, I was just in jail between <laughs> us. So we were all speaking French. So we wasn't in Spain. Right. The only time, the only thing that we know in, in Spanish was Pacho, time to go out. Right. Uh, la, la Lucha. Right when they are turning the lights on, off, mm -hmm. uh, at night for us to go to sleep, <laughs> stuff like that. What was the hardest language for you to learn? Well, uh, I don't know. I mean, French is not something, I don't know when I learned French. You yeah. know, I just grew up like into it and my dialect, but right. yeah, I just grew up, grew up into it. So yeah. I didn't actually really learn you know, even though I didn't, uh, I wasn't speaking too much early in my life, I was speaking the dialect. But the language that I really like, okay, I'm learning language was English. Yeah. 